Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 3rd of December and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 6th of September with me Michael Hewson and it's been a whiplash inducing week I think for equity markets it's been a struggle I think to really determine an overall direction uh, for risk certainly concerns about the new Omicron variant have been front and center of um, investor concerns and the markets going forward but I think more than anything I think the concerns around the Omicron variant sort of missed the wider point um, about the fact that the Delta variant is still reaping havoc wreaking havoc um, across um, markets more broadly I think at the moment anecdotally um, the Omicron variant symptoms are milder um, hospitalizations appear to be lower and I think there is increasing evidence that it's becoming slowly apparent that the strain the Omicron strain has been around probably for a while spreading unseen while the focus has been much more on the spread of Delta I think the only difference now is authorities are looking for Omicron whereas they weren't looking for it before um, that being said seen an awful lot of volatility this week in equity markets more broadly nowhere is that better borne out I think with respect to the daily candles that we've been seeing on the FTSE 100 obviously that's Friday's big sell-off um, this week Monday up Tuesday down Wednesday down Thursday up and now today we're slightly um, more negative but overall we are broadly higher on the week and I think that really gives you an indication of why um, markets have been pretty much caught off guard. I think there was a massive overreaction to Omicron last Friday. We're seeing a slow rebound on the back of that. On the back of that, and of course, then we've got to t then we've got to try and tie in um, the hawkish pivot from Jay Powell of the Federal Reserve earlier this week. I think the bigger concern going forward or I think that the bigger factor that's driving markets at the moment is what did the Federal Reserve do in just under two weeks time when they meet for the last time this year um, with respect to the tapering program. I think if the Omicron scare hadn't happened I think the bigger question is what would the Fed have done or what would the Fed be doing in the context of what we're seeing with respect to the wider economic recovery in the US. We've got US payrolls today. Obviously, we don't have sight of those numbers as I um, talk to you this morning, but the expectation is in the wake of the ADP payrolls report earlier this week of a fairly decent number. So I think the focus more than anything um, as we head into December is whether or not the payrolls report for November is going to be a decent one um, and certainly anecdotally we're seeing hiring trends pick up in the US. The various numbers that we've seen coming um, from US retailers suggest that we are seeing a pickup in hiring we're seeing a pickup in wages and we're certainly seeing that I think borne out in the retail sales numbers but also I think more importantly the wages numbers have been fairly resilient so and US consumers have been able to shrug off an awful lot of the pricing pressure um, that we've been seeing coming through with respect to the underlying prices of retail goods and services. Obviously the elephant in the room is oil prices, energy prices and as we look ahead to next week obviously we've got US CPI. Um, so today's payrolls numbers and next week's CPI numbers um, are likely to feed into a wider discussion amongst US policymakers about the likelihood of an acceleration of the Fed's tapering program. And we've seen a number of Fed policymakers this past few days talk about the need 
for a discussion about an acceleration to the taper program and essentially what that means for rate rises in 2022 we already know that the ecb is unlikely to be hiking rates in 2022 lagarde has said that the bigger question i think there is whether or not there is significantly more vocal pushback from some of the northern countries in Europe to that narrative. And certainly if you look at factory gate prices, factory, factory gate price inflation in countries like Spain, Italy and Germany, that's trending in excess of 20% a year. Um, and you're not telling me that's not going to have a significant, that's not going to act as a significant drag on the Eurozone economy in 2022, because there will be some trickle down effect or trickle up effect when it comes to headline CPI. And you're certainly starting to see the effects of that in the latest Eurozone CPI numbers, um, particularly uh, or pretty much across the board. So, you know, the, the, the ECB is stuck in a little bit of a bind. It's got permanently negative rates. It can't afford essentially to raise rates too significantly because of the borrowing costs of, say, say for example, countries like Spain and Italy. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it doesn't want to choke off the prospect of any significant um, rebound in ec economic activity. So it's stuck between a rock and a hard place. But I'm sort of digressing a little bit. Um, today's payrolls numbers are going to be very important, I think, in the, in, in the context of the wider discussion about Fed, Fed rate rise timelines and whether or not we get two or three rate rises next year. An accelerated taper is up for discussion later this month. And in the words of a number of Fed policymakers, including Loretta Mester, um, most recently, it gives the Fed optionality when it comes to reacting to much hotter um, inflationary pressures. And certainly when we look at um, the headline CPI numbers, they're at a 31 year high. So decent payrolls number this afternoon. Any number in the region of 500,000 will be fairly positive. Certainly temporary highs seasonally. Um, November and December payrolls numbers tend to be fairly positive because of seasonal hiring. And we'll get visibility obviously on the December payrolls numbers in January, um, the November payrolls numbers will only be up to around about the 14th or 15th of November. So you won't get the, the, the lead up, the 10 days in the lead up to Thanksgiving in terms of the, the payrolls numbers there. So you may not get a significantly strong number in the November numbers, but nonetheless, I think it will still match the October number of around about 535,000. And then of course you've got wages, Wages could could come in in the region of 5%. And the unemployment rate obviously is also expected to fall back as well. Um, so, you know, a, an even semi-decent payrolls report is going to feed into a discussion around an accelerated taper, which could mean that the Fed would could well announce a taper in December from $15 billion, which, which currently is the amount to a doubling of around about 30. And that in turn could lead into expectations of a stronger dollar going forward. In the short to medium term, we've seen a bit of a sell-off in the S&P 500, but we've held above this key support level of around about 4,480. That's the line in the sand that I currently have for the potential for further declines in the S&P. It has remained remarkably resilient, given all those concerns that we've heard this week about the Omicron variant. As I say, I think if it's as mild as I suspect that it could be, um, the focus will then shift back to Delta. And the, the Delta variant has almost been forgotten, but it shouldn't be because if we look at the way the DAX has been trading, we can see that there's decent demand for the DAX around about 15,000, but it has really struggled to rebound this week. And obviously we've heard out of Germany, um, the unvaccinated are facing curbs on their movement as to where they can and can't go with a view, potentially, to have mandated vaccines from 
the 1st of February in a similar move to the one that was announced by Austria um, only last week. And that is really, I think that's, I think it's, I think it's important not to under, understate how significant that could be going forward. Mandated, you know, vaccines. It's a, it's a very, it's something that it's, it's very uncomfortable, I think. I mean, and even for me, you know, who's, who ha you know, has no problem with taking the vaccine. It's certainly a slippery slope when you start to go down that sort of route. But nonetheless, digressing slightly, DAX struggling to rebound, decent support in and around that 15,000 level. I think while we're above this level on a daily close, then we should continue to fa remain fairly resilient. And I think one of the things we need to think about with respect to the volatility that we've seen over the course of the past few days, particularly, we've had a, we've seen a decent decent year for equity markets, and some of the thrusts that we're seeing to the downside could be simply a case of profit taking before year end by people who want to lock in some sort of profits for 2021 in full in full recognition of the fact that um, as we get towards Christmas, liquidity will continue to dry up further. So taking profits now as opposed to later in the month is probably um, a sensible precaution. Looking at the FTSE 100, we've underperformed this year once again. Um, but again, we've, put, we've seen some fairly decent gains so far this year. You know, if we look, if we look at where we started the year and where we are now, we're in fairly decent shape. What we do need to do is get back above this 7,200 level. 50 day moving average is acting, sorry, 200 day moving average is acting as a fairly decent area of support um, and the 7,000 level. So again, there, if we look at the key areas of support on the FTSE, obviously decent support down at 6,800. Now we've got it at 7,000. If we can get back above 7,200, we should retest the highs of 7,000. 400. I see no reason why the FTSE can't continue to slowly make its way higher towards seven and a half, seven thousand eight hundred over the course of the next 12 months. You know, as I've always said, the trend is your friend. And at the moment, there's no significant evidence that the move, the bullish move higher that we've seen so far this year um, is starting to come to an end. And really, that's all you've got to go on when you're looking at whether or not we've seen a peak. You know, we're seeing an end to the uptrend that's been in place for quite some time. We need to find evidence that it's coming to an end. And at the moment, we're not there. Now, if we look at the Dow here, we have dropped below the 200 day moving average. What's significant about that is that the following day, we re rebounded back above it. We held above 34,000. More importantly, we also held above these two lows here. So even though we closed below the 200 day moving average, what was significant about that was that we didn't do the same thing in the, in the S&P 500. You know, and this, this really comes back to what I've always said when it comes to looking at markets. Dow theory, the averages need to confirm each other. And when you're looking at US markets, you need to look at them not just in isolation, you need to look at them in the realm. And when you've got the S&P well above its 200 day moving average, the Dow falling below its 200 day moving average is not that significant um, in the wider scheme of things, because generally they go up as a collective and they go down as a collective. And that's what you always have to think about when you're talking about markets in general. And it's the same with the NASDAQ as well. The Dow has underperformed as well. And it's not really a true indicator of what um, you know is driving um, the wider US market up move. And certainly I think if you look at the way this market's been trading, we can actually draw a nice little trend line all the way through these lows through here and through there, and then just push that right through there. So there's your there's your primary trend line on the NASDAQ 100. So we can afford to fall all the way back here and still keep the current up move that's been in place intact. Uh, and, and essentially, that, that, is, that is essentially where we are when it comes to equity markets. So, Non-farms, decent payrolls report should then lead us into US CPI, which is due out on the 10th of December. 
and it's becoming I think much more universally acknowledged that the Federal Reserve is very much behind the curve when it comes to inflation although the recent slide in oil prices has bought the central bank some time and we can certainly see the effect that the recent drop in oil prices has had um, we're, we're down quite significantly from the peaks of earlier in, in October dropped all the way back down to 68 um, significantly we've held above this a little bit of a trend line resistance here and I think this is essentially where OPEC I think that's the sweet spot for crude oil prices too high you trigger demand destruction too low and OPEC starts to get a little bit antsy so they've announced um, that they're going to go ahead with the 400,000 increase in output on the 4th of January with flexibility to perhaps change their mind but this candle here is particularly significant we've made a new low and we've closed higher so that is potentially bullish so any dips in the oil price likely to find a steady stream of buyers in and around this sort of area through here with a view to drifting drifting up around to to around about 76 dollars a barrel which is to say it's pretty much the sweet spot if we'd also look on a weekly basis we're down six weeks in a row that's the worst sequence of declines in over 18 months and would suggest that perhaps we are near a little bit of a consolidation phase now for crude oil prices but in the wider scheme of things US CPI is at a 31 year high of 6.2 percent in October it's likely to go higher in November 6.1 percent 6.7 percent according to some estimates with core CPI expected to rise towards 4.9 or even 5 percent so that will I think reinforce any narrative about an accelerated taper a strong CPI number with the Fed in blackout period from next week ahead of its meeting I think will reinforce the narrative when it comes to potentially um, an acceleration of the taper later this month we've also got Chinese trade numbers due out on the 7th of December and these should give a good indication as to whether or not there's 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 strong demand in the global economy particularly around the export numbers which have been very very strong um, in recent months I think with all the warnings that port disruption might impact the lead up to Christmas we've seen lots of businesses try and get ahead of that by ordering early allowing themselves more time to build up their Christmas pre-Christmas inventory and that's been reflected in the uh, export numbers um, which we saw in October rise to 27.1 percent which was only a modest slowdown from September's 28.1 percent so um, the November numbers this week um, are predicted to show a show a slowdown in exports a significant slowdown in exports with a rise of 19.8 percent that seems a little on the low side I'd be surprised if they rise as low as that I would expect to see a number in the region of about 22 or 23 percent imports expected to stay on the weak side albeit slightly stronger to 20.6 obviously the Chinese government is still employing a zero Covid strategy that has consequences um, certainly for internal demand imports have been a little bit weak they collapsed to 17.6 percent in September from 33.1 in August um, that was the high water mark so you know is the Chinese economy going to pick up as a consequence of um, singles day on the 11th of November and will there be will, will there have been a bit of a pickup in imports as a consequence of that central bank front we've got the RBA coming up over the course of the next uh, few days and certainly the inflation narrative has or the the dovish narrative of the RBA has knocked the Aussie for six we've dropped below those previous lows through here and we're now falling back to these lows all the way back here in September 2020 so that's the next key support for the Aussie dollar if we draw a line through that through there we've got 69.90 69.80 so it'll be interesting to see how the governor of the RBA Philip Lowe positions his um positions his policy when you've got the RBNZ hiking rates 
for the second time uh, this year. Um, last month's pushback by the RBA with respect to a rate hike wasn't unexpected, um, although they did get rid of um, yield curve control, um, which took the heat out of some of the um, pressure on two-year yields. But nonetheless, two-year yields are still well above where current rates are, 0.1%. So if we look at the latest GDP numbers out of Australia, they were much better than expected. And that would give me cause to think that perhaps Philip Lowe, who pushed back against a rate rise um, in 2022 and by saying that any move was unlikely to come before 2023, might be slightly more positive about the Australian economy and maybe bring back the prospect that a rate hike might come in 2022, thus giving us a little bit of a rebound in the Aussie dollar, which looks pretty sick at the moment but is approaching a very, very key support level from all the way back in 2020. So I'll be keeping an eye on the overall narrative around the Aussie dollar when the RBA meets on Tuesday. Um, in terms of the earnings picture, it's a pretty slow week, but there is one particular stock that I've got my eye out for, and that is Rolls-Royce. Um, been a bit of a mixed bag for Rolls-Royce. Obviously, it's been affected by weakness in the travel sector. But again, it's not done too badly so far this year. In August, Rolls-Royce surprised the markets with an unexpected profit of £393 million pounds for the first half. Um, markets were expecting a small loss, so that's a positive. Um, the share price has managed to make some fairly decent gains, though obviously concerns about Omicron, Delta, travel restrictions, and obviously airline travel, air travel and what have you, has weighed on the share price a little bit. On the plus side, transatlantic travel has reopened. So that should mean that their maintenance contracts when it comes to servicing um, civil aviation aircraft engines should start to bring in a little bit more income. Um, it's, you know, EFH, aviation engine flying hours, these have been improving. Um, hopefully they'll continue to go in the right direction. And they have actually announced a number of very important contract wins in recent weeks as well. Um, a contract for its F-130 engines, which are used to power the B-52s for the next 30 years, that deal is worth 1.9 billion pounds. And it's also announced that it's agreed a deal with Bain Partners to sell ITP Aero for 1.7 billion euros. Um, while also winning a government, a UK government contract for its mini nuclear reactor technology. So, um, you know, all, by, by all accounts, it's been, you know, fairly positive. We obviously, we saw a big drop there. We're slowly starting to claw those gains back. So hopefully this week's Q3 update should paint a more positive picture um, for the company's overall prospects going forward. We've also got Ocado, which has been one of the underperformers so far this year as, as evidenced by the share price movements here. You know, we saw decent gains in 2022. Obviously, since the lockdowns have been re re relaxed, um, the share price has struggled. It's below its 200 day moving average. More importantly, it's managed to find a little bit of a base down here and did experience a bit of an uplift at the end of November on speculation that Marks and Spencers might look at making a bid for the business. Now, this was broker chatter. This was nothing um, specific from Marks and Spencers, but certainly that would make sense. Marks and Spencers has been turning itself around. Um, it's just only just over a year ago signed a really you know, positive deal with Ocado. Um, and as part of that turnaround strategy, it would certainly make for a fairly decent fit. So this week's fourth quarter numbers from Ocado, um, should give us a decent insight into not only the delivery capacity because they're opening a whole host of new centers um new new facilities um they reopened the andover facility they're on course to beat last year's total revenue number of 2.3 billion pounds they're adding perth fleet and andover um obviously the return to normal of the eris center in november is also likely to help 
and Ocado has said it remains optimistic of sustaining revenue growth with the addition of extra capacity at Bista and another new facility in Luton expected to boost delivery capacity to 700,000 orders per week. So be interested to see what they have to say for themselves when they announce their fourth quarter numbers on the 9th of December. So um, let's just have a quick look at the currencies before I sign off for this week. Cable's looking a little bit sick. We've hit the bottom of the channel in the same way that we hit the bottom of the channel all the way back in July. The line of least resistance, I think, for me at the moment is the big, big support level for me is 131.60. It's this area through here, but also coincides with that low there around about 131.30. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very significant support level that we're approaching now. You would expect, you'd like to think that we, we could well see a bit of a rebound back to around about 134, 135. But certainly my bullish cable scenario has taken a little bit of a beating in recent months. Hopefully my euro sterling will fare better. We are starting to continue, we're continuing to see weakness in that. If we draw a line through this, these, these highs through here, I've been a little bit flexible with respect to that one there. But certainly if we look at euro sterling, we've, we've certainly got decent resistance all the way through this line here, as well as the 200 day moving average and this peak at around about 85.40. So 85.40, 85.70 should be um, toppy. Obviously, if we break above the 200 day moving average, that blows my um, weaker euro, stronger sterling theory out of the water. Well, it doesn't blow it out of the water, but it certainly delays it. But if you're thinking in terms of um, ECB is likely to remain on hold for some time, and the Bank of England will eventually raise rates at some point over the course of the next um, few weeks. If it's not December, then potentially in February, they're trying to um, pin down the Bank of England when it comes to the timing of a potential rate hike. Um, it's like trying to trying to pin the tail on a donkey. So it's very difficult to sort of draw any conclusions from that. But price action is key here. And we're still very much in a downtrend for euro sterling um so i think pretty much i think that's pretty much it um for uh this week as i say we've got non-farm payrolls later today hopefully that will reinforce the bullish narrative when it comes to a potential fed taper or an acceleration of the fed taper later this month um so that's it for this week thank you very much for listening this is michael hewson talking to you from cmc markets <laughs>